Son of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen. risen. We read later on in the service from Psalm 33, I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my troubles in the translation we have, or tribulations. I sought the Lord is what we are to do, and the Lord seeks those who seek Him. St. Gregory Palamas in his homily on this feast says that God longs for those who long for Him. He thirsts for those who thirst for Him. He desires, of course, God desires all of us. But He especially comes to those who make their efforts to come unto Him. And we have that in this feast of the Samaritan woman. Yes, at first she seems to come primarily for a, a physical reason. And of course it is a definite physical need in the land where she lived to have water, a very dry place. And they had to make great efforts to go get water. She had heavy, heavy water pots. I don't know if you've ever seen water pots in that time, but they were rather large. And to do that took enormous efforts, but it was also absolutely necessary for her, for her family, for anyone around her. So she goes to this well of Jacob, desiring water that she might have life, but physical life. And this is very important. But the Lord was there at that time as well, and not by accident. Nothing that the Lord does is by accident. And he saw something in her heart, even if it's but a tiny spark, as he did with many of our saints who didn't seem to have much in them at first. But he lit that spark of fire and flame. And they, of course, attain to sanctity because of him lighting that spark. So he goes to this woman, this woman who was absolutely abhorrent to the people of the Jews because the Samaritans were considered sort of a Judaic heresy. They had their own way of worshiping and they weren't part of the people of Israel. And she, being a woman as well, was someone that the Lord would never have spoken to if she were not kin, and certainly not to a Samaritan woman. But the Lord does far more than that. He, he deigns to share water that she gives him, which they never would have done because they would have considered themselves defiled. He also offers her living water himself, which a Jew never would have done. But the Lord reaches out to us all, despite whatever race, whatever people we are from, wherever we are from, whatever our background is, the Lord comes to us and seeks us and he gradually begins to lead this woman into becoming a vessel herself, a vessel that is fit for carrying living water, which is Christ himself. And he leads her gradually by stages, if you follow this. He leads her first from the physical and a little bit farther on and a little bit farther on. It is that way with the spiritual life. You don't typically make large leaps at once. You make that first move of repentance and gradually move toward Christ. As if we read, of course, in the epistles of Paul, where Paul at one point is talking about the sins that he doesn't want to do, he, he does, and the, and the good that he wants to do, he does not do. But he later moves on to say, I no longer, long, no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He, too, makes a progression in his spiritual life from his initial days. This is with Mary of Egypt when she goes to the doors. And, of course, it is hard for us to see anything in Mary of Egypt. But Mary saw, but the Lord saw something in Mary and blocked her way to the church. And while this is a monumental event, as Paul experienced a monumental event with the Lord coming to him on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, the Lord saw something very deep and buried but he saw something that was quite redeemable and Mary of course made the move and she goes off into the desert and for many many decades lives the life and gradually moves from glory to glory it is the same with this woman we see with this woman a woman who apparently knew something of her faith and knew something of the scriptures because she says we Samaritans worship on this mountain, the Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. She knew something, maybe not a lot, but she knew something. The Lord begins to take her even farther. He tells her that we no longer worship there, but we will worship in spirit because God is spirit. And true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth, leading her even farther that all people might be saved, to drink of this living water, which is Christ himself, teaching her to seek 
that which is holy, and not only that which is necessary for worldly life, but to seek that which is above. The Gregory Palamas also has a beautiful line where he says, if you occupy your attention with what is holy, then God, then you will be worthy of God's visitation, of being visited by God. Because that is the sweet savor which God finds the scent of, catches the scent of. He found something that he saw, his image and likeness in this woman. He found perhaps a little bit of a love for the scriptures and for faith, even though her faith was misguided and not complete and distorted. He found something that he could redeem and began, of course, to move toward her a little closer a little closer and taking her deeper into this passage and deeper to where he guides her along but there's an obstacle and this obstacle of course is she has a rather serious sin in her life we all have serious sins in our life but hers rather stood out and him knowing her heart lest we think that the Lord doesn't know things how many people I've heard said that they're going to take a sin to their grave or that you know it's just between me and God, and not really that big a deal. But God knows every detail of our lives, lest we forget that. And this he said, bringing her along the way, go and call <coughs> your husband. I don't have a husband, he, she says. Indeed, you say right that I do not have a husband. You have had five husbands. The one you have is not your own. Now imagine hearing that from someone who you've never met, never seen, and they know your deepest, darkest secrets, but they don't judge you. He's looking at her with complete and absolute love, not with judgment, but with love, and calling her to task for something that desperately needs to be amended. And watch her reaction. She doesn't get angry. She doesn't defend herself. She doesn't make excuses, as we are all wont to do at times with our own sins. And this is the reason I did this and that and that and the other. This person made me do that and this happened in my life. No, that's not the right answer. The right answer is I'm a sinner. And she bore it very well and calmly and meekly with humility. So the Lord sees even more that he can work with. A humble vessel, a broken and contrite heart that he will not despise. He sees that he can work with. And she talks even more, bringing deeper into the mystery. She says that I know when Messiah comes, who's Christ, he will teach us all things. And even she knew that the Messiah was to be coming, was ready for this and waiting for this. And the Lord says very powerful words which we sometimes pass over, I that speak with you am he. Bam. Right in the face, confessing himself who he is. To this woman, is not a Jew, not a man, not of the leadership, not of the holy. I am he. They go at me. I am. Saying the name of God. A very profound confession. And she flees what she is doing. Goes to her people, goes to her kinsfolk, goes to the people of the town and tells them what happened. Notice what she did. She left what she was doing. Her husband, who was not her husband, needed this water. Whatever family she had, she had sons, we know that from the life of St. Fultini, who this is, needed water. She didn't think about the water. She briefly became Mary of Mary and Martha and forgot about her task and sought the one thing needful and ran to the town because something far more important than physical water was there. But that living water that washes away our sins, purifies us, heals us, nourishes us, and brings us to newness of life. That runs throughout our bodies if we make ourselves living vessels and fills our souls to overflowing. We talked about in the mid-feast, as we talked about with the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, and this water comes into play again because Christ is that living water by only which we can have life. 
And she runs and tells them. Doesn't even say goodbye, it seems. Just runs to tell the people with great exuberance, much as the apostles end up doing when he is risen from the dead. And they finally figure it out. As he brought them along gradually, piece by piece. And she runs and tells the people, and they go out to see for themselves, because they're amazed at her work. They must have had some respect for her. And they go and say, we no longer believe because what you have told us is because we've heard him ourselves. And we too have heard him ourselves. And the Lord comes to us each and every day, distinctly each and every day, if we are but listening and looking, and tries to bring us a little bit farther along the path. But at some point in our lives, usually not that many times, so we have to take advantage of those times, he has his moment with us at the well, where he comes to us and he offers us living water, very distinctly. And he says, you do not have a husband, you have had five. He tells us our issues, he tells us our sins, he points out what needs to be amended. And what is expected of us then is precisely what he had with Fotimi. She took that message and ran with it. She didn't wait. She didn't wait till tomorrow. She didn't wait to say, oh, I'm not ready yet. The Lord comes when he comes, wherever we are. It doesn't matter whether we think we're ready or not. When the Lord comes is the time for our repentance, is the time for our salvation. And when he comes and offers us that living water, we must grasp to drink it. We must turn away from our sins that we had. And with our lives go and proclaim the glory of God, as Fotini did, unto the point of going before the ruler himself and confessing Christ to being martyred with her sons. Brothers and sisters, the moment comes each and every day, and it has come in every one of our lives where we wouldn't be standing here right now, or sitting here right now. So we must at that point, embrace that Christ, embrace the living water, drink the living water, and mend what needs to be amended, change and move toward the kingdom of God because no one else needs to tell us because we have heard it from him ourselves. That Messiah has come, who is the Christ, and he that has spoken to us is Jesus. Christ is risen. Indeed. Indeed.